Well, good morning. For those of you that don't know, my name is Tom. I'm one of the leaders here. It's my privilege to bring the Word of God uh, this morning. You know, we hold this up and we believe that this is, without error, the Word of God. And that by ingesting this in our lives, He, by His Spirit and through the Word, will transform us. This is the plumb line, the straight line for life right here. Everything we need is here. Now, at this moment in time, we are in the middle of a series called Church Forward to ensure that we are fit and ready as a church to stand together in this spiritual battle that Paul is talking about in Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 20. We spent quite a lot of time looking at what the fiery darts are that Paul is talking about, the ways that the enemy might try to attack us and attack the church. And now we've moved to have shifted away from what the enemy is doing to the way that we are defended, to the way that we are defended by the armour that we wear and by standing together within that. Now, two weeks ago, Andrew looked at the helmet of salvation. He bought a motorcycle helmet uh, and wore that as a, as a demonstration. Last week, Margaret spoke to us about the belt of truth and how, like, you should be really glad that I'm wearing a belt this morning. Otherwise, you'd get a very different image of this preacher, okay? So the belt is one of the first things to go on. It is vitally important. And then today we are looking at the breastplate of righteousness. Now before I go any further, can you just give me a show of hands? Because we're Pentecostal, so we're comfortable with our hands in the air. Give me a show of hands if you have ever cracked a rib. That's surprisingly less of you than I thought. Okay, I think that was two people. Wow. Look, I was uh, very naughty at school, as you already know. That was as a student. I was also quite naughty as a teacher when I returned to school in my adult life. And one of the things that I used to do for my tutor group was I would create my classroom games. We had classroom cricket, which was amazing. I don't even like cricket, but this game was just fantastic. And we also had classroom volleyball. Like, I know you're thinking, how does that work? Uh, the reason we did that is because in 2012, the Team GB volleyball team came to the school that I was teaching at to reside there as volleyball coaches. And so they were coaching kids, and their office was just off of my classroom. Well, there's two good opportunities for this. By the way, I was a hospitality and catering teacher predominantly, so my classroom was, it wasn't the safest place, it was full of ovens. And knives and pots and pans and things like that. But nevertheless, I invented classroom volleyball. And we had these big oven like islands, and in between them were these bays where you'd stand and do your work and wash up and things like that. So the court was two of these bays with an island of ovens in between. The ball was something like this, which is made up of paper. You know, every teacher has paper. And because I was that kind of teacher, I had cling film and tin foil as well. So the volleyball, that's it. That's not an official one. I made this myself this morning. You can make one yourself. It's easy. Blue Peter. But stop messing about, guys. It's very naughty. Um, now, I was playing Ben Pipes, who was the seven foot captain. I don't know if he was actually seven foot, but when I did the back to back, his buttons were in my shoulder. I'm literally not kidding, there was a photo I tried to find it for you, I didn't. Um, now, I was playing Ben Pipes, and because he was the captain of Team GB, I was on a mission, because this is my game. I made this up, I don't care if he was a volleyball professional. And I wanted to spike the ball down into his side of the court, so I jumped, and I, all my kids were watching, spectating this, this game. And as I came down, I landed on the edge of the oven. It wasn't on, you would get to know. But I did, like, I heard something kind of go like that, and I thought that's not the oven that made that noise, and it hurt like blazes. I had cracked a rib. Now, there's a couple of things here 
that could have been employed to avert my pain. Because the pain of a cracked rib is horrendous. Every time you breathe in, it hurts. Is that right, you two? Every time you breathe, and it lasts for weeks. You, you can't put a plaster on a cracked rib, you've just got to live with it. And so I was living with this pain. Now, a couple of things could have averted that. Firstly, number one, not doing something that I should not have been doing. That would have averted the pain. Not being a numpty and trying to show off to the GP captain would have been another thing that would have averted the pain. And then the final thing that would have averted that pain would have been wearing body armour. If I had a breastplate on that morning, I would have been fine. And the thing is, the ribs are something a little bit like a breastplate, right? They protect this part of our body, the, the most important organs here. But I tell you what, the ribs on their own are not enough. And that's the point. That's why we need a breastplate. If you're going to go into battle, you want to be wearing something on top of your ribs for that extra layer of protection to protect the most important inward part, the heart. Now, if you apply the same logic spiritually, the same thing is true. What we already have in our toolkit, like our spiritual ribs, if you like, are just not enough. We need something more. And the thing is, our heart, as Margaret mentioned last week, our core is vulnerable. And what we have to protect it just won't cut the mustard. We need a different kind of covering. Something that we don't already possess. Better than anything that we already possess. Or anything that we can make for ourselves. We need something completely different here. Now the question I have going into this this morning. Because this is talking about the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate covers the heart and the inner organs. But what does righteousness have to do with the heart? Well, it turns out, everything. Everything. Because our hearts are to do with the core of who we are. Out of our hearts flows our thoughts, our words, and our actions. They all come from here. The core of who we are. And righteousness has to do with right standing or rightness, acting rightly. Okay, the Lexicon Bible Dictionary says that both the Greek and the Hebrew words, that the righteousness there is about the quality or the state or the characteristic of being in the right. Now, husbands, I think you know all about this. <laughs> because if you're like me, I'm really Sit right behind me, I can get clogged. Where's that volleyball? Yeah, it's safe. <laughs> I, when I serve food to Jess, or when I'm preparing in the kitchen, or a cup of tea, I always, to help me remember which one's Jess's and which one's mine, she has her tea different to me. Like, I always put hers on the right, because Jess is always right. Right? <laughs> it's an easy way to remember. And husbands, you know the deal here. Happy wife, happy life. Okay, so if you can just have that motif, the wife is right, then you will have a better life here, okay? In, in relation, I mean, in actual fact, guys, we think we're right just as much, and if you don't believe me, go to Ikea, get the most complicated thing you can possibly buy to assemble, and then disregard the instructions like you always do, and try to fix it yourself, because we always think we know how to do it without the instructions, right? But in relation to God, Righteousness can refer to a divine attribute or divine activity. And in relation to humans, righteousness is often about legal and social status, like a moral state of righteousness. The quality of being righteous is strongly related to justness, being just and justice. The two are very, very close. Acting rightly or justly in our ethics, in our morals, in our social behaviour, in our communities, in our families, 
you, you get the picture. And don't we think a lot of justice? We, we have a high view of justice, don't we? We get angry about scams. How many of you have had a scam text or, or a scam email? It doesn't have you up. You know, I actually sent a text back to the last one I got and I said, I hope you're happy with your life choices. I probably shouldn't have done that. I'm not righteous on my own. We, we can't stand greed, we can't stand violence, it makes us angry, and it should. And actually, we want offenders to be brought to justice, right? We see horrendous things happening in the world, and we want the offenders brought to justice. We have a strong sense of fairness, especially when it concerns our rights. But... Justice isn't only about dealing with the oppressor, it's also about lifting up the oppressed. Do we still have a strong sense of justice? It's why God requires his people to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. That's Micah 6 and verse 8. And the other thing is that justice, it not only means like others brought to justice, if we demand justice of God, then we must be demanding justice upon ourselves. And actually, we don't want that. Because we don't want the weight of the responsibility for our actions and our thoughts and our words. So we all want justice when we're the beneficiaries. But we don't want to be the recipients of it. And the thing is, that the things that I've said and done, well, that's not all that God judges in justice. He also judges the thoughts of my heart. Now, I might have managed to get through life without a lie and without a negative word about anyone. Could I honestly say I've never thought that? I may have got through my adult life without having an affair, without having a violent encounter where I've had somebody else, but does that mean I've never thought about that? Jeremiah 17, 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind. And maybe you know of the encounter that Samuel has when he's searching to anoint David as king of Israel. And this little David comes out and he, he says, surely not. But God says, I don't judge the outer appearance, I judge the heart. Now, how many of you have seen A Few Good Men, the film with Tom Cruise in it? Yeah, and so you've got Jack Nicholson in there, and Tom Cruise says, I want the truth, and Jack Nicholson says, you can't want the truth. Like that, there's, there's more than a sense of a courtroom drama in this whole issue of righteousness that Paul is bringing up here. This is the great courtroom that uh, the writer of Hebrews is talking about in Hebrews 9.27 when he says, Man is destined to die once and face judgment. In this courtroom, we are the accused. And let me tell you, we are guilty. Right, that's the bottom line. There, there's plenty of evidence against us. And then we've got the prosecutor, the accuser, that's Satan. And like I said, he's got boxes and boxes of evidence against us. He, he might be the father of lies, but he doesn't need lies. When it comes to accusing me of the things that I've done in my life, it's the truth that I'm more afraid of him spouting out rather than the lies. And in this courtroom, God is the judge, and he is judging from his righteousness. He has to outwork justice and satisfy the requirements of the law in his judgments. Otherwise, he is no longer just and right. So he must deliver justice. Is anyone here feeling that, oh, I'll be all right. I'll give it a go. 
His righteousness is the lens through which our hearts will be judged. Wow. The scales of justice upon which our hearts will be weighed are His righteousness. How do we balance them? God's righteousness versus our own. Let me consider that for just a second. I will not be judged in relation to you by whether I'm better or worse than you. I will be judged in relation to God and his goodness. Now Max Ricardo, he was talking about this and the goodness of man, the goodness of God. And he said, look, imagine this for just a moment. If God's standard, the, the like, weight of his righteousness was like the distance from here to the moon, I, I tell you what, you might be able to jump a little higher than me, but there's no way you're getting to the moon. That's the problem that we're in. A couple of examples of this God's righteousness versus ours. He is the rock, this is Deuteronomy 32 and 4. He is the rock, his works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just, is he. Or Psalm 119, 137 to 138 is a very old psalm. You are righteous, Lord, and your laws are right. The statutes that you have laid down are righteous, they are fully trustworthy. Psalm 71, 19, your righteousness, God, reaches to the heavens. That's like the picture of here to the moon. You who have done great things, who is like you, God? And in Psalm 97, verse 2, clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. Now, juxtapose that, or compare that, if you like, to us. Right, here's a couple of little scriptures about us, and you know these are true, your heart will tell you this for sure. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Proverbs 14, 12. Or Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things, as I've said, and beyond cure, who can understand it? Or Luke 6, 45, and the same thing in Matthew 15. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And then finally, in Romans, Paul says, Jews and Gentiles are alike, all are under the power of sin, as it is written. Listen to this. There is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away, and they together have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Actually, there is one. We'll come to him in a minute. But we're in trouble, right? If you get that picture this morning, we need a cracking defence. Right, I want the best defence lawyers I can possibly get. Now, if you go to a court of law, I think you can represent yourself. I think that's true. You can reject legal counsel, you can go forward, and you can represent yourself. The problem is, I think you've got to either be really clever or really stupid to do that. And the thing also is that in a human court, that's being judged by humans who don't really know the truth. That's why you're in court, they're trying to figure that out. And you can sway with persuasion, but you can't do that when our heart is peeled open before the one who sees all things. You can't represent yourself in this courtroom. You might be good, but you're not good enough. Any of your own moral goodness, any of your own moral righteousness is not enough. Like ribs, they will give way under the pressing weight of the truth. We need a different kind of covering. Greater, stronger, better than we have ourselves. We need help. We need rescue, we need a strong defence, we need acquittal. Listen, this is the good news, because here is the gospel. 
I'm going to put it in these courtroom terms for you. This is the gospel. We are in custody. We are accused of grievous wrongdoing against God Almighty and we are guilty and awaiting trial where we will be sentenced appropriately for the evidence in front of us. And there is a panoply of evidence in front of us and we have no defence. That's the hard part of the Gospel, but here's the good part. God, the judge himself, steps in on our behalf to rescue and acquit us and set us free by sending his own son to stand in our place, to die once and face judgment on our behalf. God intervenes. Look, Paul hasn't just plucked this idea of the breastplate of righteousness from thin air. He's building on the thought. He's actually hyperlinking Isaiah 59, I think 14 to 17, which Margaret referenced last week. It's a passage about the divine warrior. And it says of him, I'll repeat this, the Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. There was no one who was righteous. And he saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. Appalled that there was nobody to rescue us. And so his own arm achieved salvation for him. His own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate. You see this hyperlink that Paul is making here. In fact, the word that Paul uses for righteousness, he also uses exactly the same word elsewhere to talk about justification. In Romans 10, and if you don't know Jesus, listen very carefully. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, made righteous. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Jesus, thank you. In Ephesians, because we're in Ephesians, and Paul is like, this isn't like just a brand new thought, even in Ephesians, Paul is all the way through, he's trying to get us to see something here. And he says in Ephesians 2, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace that you have been saved. He justifies us. We, now, the just, because of his justification, live by faith. Okay? I'm going to kind of start bringing this in. This righteousness that we put on as a breastplate is the righteousness of Christ. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Look, this is the breastplate of righteousness, not the breastplate for righteousness. It's not a reward, it's a covering. You see that? It's a breastplate of his righteousness, not for our righteousness. It's a gift of grace, not by works, so that no one most Paul talks about. Saved by his grace, clothed in his righteousness, so that when we stand before that judge, he doesn't see our sin and our shame and our unrighteousness. He sees his son. He sees his son's righteousness. He sees that perfect justice when he looks at us in that room. If we have professed with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believed in our heart, that God raised him from the dead. And actually nothing that the accuser can levy against us can bear any weight against that breastplate. But that's not all. 
Righteousness is not only our covering for that day in court, it is also for the here and now. To defend against Satan's attacks here and now, whether they be lies or whether they be truth, because we all carry past. The breastplate of righteousness, Christ's righteousness upon us, answers Satan's accusations, whether they're real or made up. But also, this breastplate of righteousness, it preserves the authenticity and the power of our witness as Christ's ambassadors. Look, this righteousness, it should be visibly outworking in our lives. Now this morning I deliberately chose to wear a pink shirt. Because when you look at me, what colour shirt do you see? You see pink, right? Unless you're coloured by the middle of the group. But hopefully, you're looking at me and you're seeing that I have put on a pink shirt this morning. And the reason you know that I've put on a pink shirt is because you can look at me and lo and behold, my shirt is pink. Hallelujah. When I put on the breastplate of righteousness, you should be able to look at me and see the righteousness of Christ being outworked. Perhaps not perfectly, but that should be like really the foundation of how we want to behave in our lives and he even helps us to do it. What does this breastplate look like on us? Husbands, this is what Paul says, love your wives. I'm not just talking about buying them flowers, chocolates, being quick to apologise, let them be in the right. Paul's thought is husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church. Well, wait a minute, nails were driven through his wrists and his feet for the church. That's how you are to love your wife. Wives, Paul says. Controversial verses, I'm going to reword it slightly. Wives, don't be overbearing to your husbands. Don't dominate them. Like, men love to feel respected. Now, I'm not saying just respect them no matter what, if they're being conquers, you know. I'm not saying that. But wives, love your husbands as they love you. Don't dominate. It means children, honour your parents. Parents, don't be harsh or exacerbate your children. Workers, work hard as if you're working for the Lord. And bosses, don't like make slaves out of your stuff. Treat them with fairness and righteousness and justice. Paul says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. That's what wearing righteousness looks like. Completely humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's what it looks like. Are you wearing the breastplate of righteousness? Don't just wear it for your day in court. It's not your Sunday best. It's your everyday work work. And it will see you through this life and all of the ways that Satan attempts to attack you and the church. Quickest way to give credit to people that are trying to bring the church into disrepute is to do something disreputable. Much harm has been done by Christians misbehaving. But also this breastplate won't just see us through this life, it will see us into that courtroom. I don't want everything laid bare before me like a stack of evidence on that day. But I know I have one plea. It's not guilty. It should be. But Jesus has already paid the penalty. He's already stood in the courtroom. And so by believing and professing, I wear Christ 
into the courtroom. And so my plea is Jesus. That's my plea. Yes, God, I see all of that stuff that is horrendous. But he is my righteousness, my one defense, Jesus. Whose righteousness will sustain you? And you come forward. Let's just bow our heads as we pray.